样。Uh, Kathy, do we want to uh, get started? Yeah, uh, it's a it's eleven forty seven. Okay. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this exciting event, a lecture on uh, San Francisco's Chinatown, hosted by Brookdale's Asia Society. Uh, I am Dai Juan Gao, uh, the faculty advisor to the Asia Society. Uh, this lecture will end at 1.15. Uh, uh, we're gonna use the last 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, feel free to type your questions in the chat. Uh, you can find the chat on the bottom. Um, so to distinguish you know, questions from comments, you, you know, it's better if you put uh, the letter Q before your question, so I can, you know, uh, I can uh, see your question more easily. Um, please mute yourself during the lecture. Um, okay, we are very privileged to have a Kathy Chin Liang, the author of San Francisco's Chinatown, as our guest speaker today. Uh, Kathy Chin Liang is an award-winning journalist who has been published in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Sunset Magazine, and many other newspapers and magazines, as well as National Geographic books. She is the executive editor of BayAreaFamilyTravel.com, an online magazine for families who love adventure. As a second generation American born Chinese, she grew up in San Francisco's Sunset District and spent nearly every weekend in Chinatown visiting her grandmother and helping her mother shop for groceries. 
though she has traveled widely, rediscovering her Chinatown roots through her work on this book has been the journey of a lifetime. She lives in Sunnyvale, California with her devoted husband, Frank Leung Jr. and is the proud mother of two grown children, Gwendolyn and Aaron. We will begin with a two minute uh, trailer. Here is the trailer. Okay, now please, to jo uh, please join me to welcome our guest speaker, Kathy Chen Liang. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great, great. Um, I just thank you, Professor Gao and the Asia Society for hosting me today. We're so happy to um, be here. And thanks to Zoom, we're able to do this cross country event. So wonderful. I wanted to um, start off um, with, again, I will be talking about San Francisco's Chinatown, which is very different from New York's Chinatown. This photo is this iconic street scene of San Francisco's Chinatown. And for those who have visited um, as a tourist or maybe um, have come here often, these red lanterns above are probably what first comes to mind when you think of Chinatown. So it's not a coincidence that the cover of our new Chinatown book is one of the colorful facades facing Grant Avenue, the main tourist artery. And this building once housed the historic Four Seas restaurant. And it's now home to the contemporary restaurant called Mr. Jews. We'll be looking at other um, iconic images like these historic street lamps and the pagoda rooftops that line Grant Avenue. But none of these um, really represent the true historic Chinatown. The true historic Chinatown began in the 1800s when the Chinese first came to the West Coast and they called America Gold Mountain or Gum San. And when they first came here, Chinatown did not look like this at all. It was like a ghetto. What happened was after the 1906 earthquake, um, the city leaders wanted to get rid of Chinatown and tell Chinatown to move because the property, that area was very expensive. It was right next to the financial district. It was right next to Knob Hill. But the Chinese leaders had an idea. Why not, they proposed, why not turn 
our Chinatown into a tourist Chinatown with elaborate architecture, pagoda rooftops. This will put more money into Chinatown, into San Francisco's coffers. Well, the San Francisco leaders agreed. And that is why we have such decorative rooftops and elaborate architecture in this part of Chinatown. It's because it was a survival mechanism. Now, if you look, um, here, these are one of the identification cards um, that early Chinese had to carry with them to prove that they were here legally. Many people were upset. They felt like it was like wearing a dog tag every time you were stopped. They had to first come to a place called Angel Island. Um, you would compare it to Ellis Island in New York, but Angel Island was much, much worse. People were incarcerated, children were separated from their families. While the Europeans were processed quickly and established, the Chinese were separated out, put into their own detention camps, staying um, anywhere from several weeks to several years. People who um, did not pass the, um, the immigration test um, and were thought of as maybe being imposters, they were sent back to China. And some were so upset they actually committed suicide because it is more shameful to go back to China with no status, nothing, than uh, so you would just rather would kill yourself. While they were there in detention camps, people inscribed in Chinese just notes and poems of their suffering. This boy named Yang Yi Feng Li says, everyone's got a number. I think my number is 80340. They put your number on the blackboard and you know you have to go to interrogation or a health checkup. They didn't use names. On the day they let you go, your number's on the blackboard and it says San Francisco. So all of these inscriptions have been preserved so people could see them on the bunkhouse walls. There's two really huge um, and important sculptures in Chinatown. This one is the goddess of democracy. You might have seen this on television in 1989. This was actually a 30 foot tall um, sculpture made of paper mache made by students in China uh, when they had their um, uprising in Beijing. And this is a replica. We also have this very important bronze statue called Comfort Women, and it's in St. Mary's Square. And it remembers the tragic treatment of the young Chinese, Korean, and Filipino girls that were kidnapped as sex slaves to be used by the Japanese in World War II. This was such a controversial statue, they cut off, Osaka cut off sister relationship with San Francisco. And here we have a very important mural called the um, Seven, 100 Years of Chinese in America. On the left, you see Chinese um, that were in China just really suffering there in poverty and it moves all the way over to the right panel where you see Chinese finally assimilated. Well, the painter is named James Leong and he was criticized by the Chinese themselves because Chinese felt like it was a stereotype, but this was all historically accurate. And uh, James Leong was so hurt that he left America altogether and he has reestablished himself as a very popular painter in Europe. He later came back and um, he, you can see these in uh, Chinatown at one of the museums. This is an ordinary place, but it has an extraordinary story. This is called the Cameron House. Here in the late 1800s, a missionary named Donna Dina Cameron rescued with her team as many as 30,000 women, Chinese women who were trafficked and also girls, Chinese girls who were used for domestic slavery. And so today it continues its work now as the social services center, helping Chinese in the community. Early on, um, after the gold rush and after the uh, railroad, where's this? Okay. All right, um, after the railroad, San Francisco Chinatown became this light industrial center. They were making sewing garments and they were making shoes. So as a history changed, so did the evolution of Chinatown. Chinatown did something very interesting. Uh, you see the Chinese New Year Parade here. 
the parades are not, not a Chinese thing. They borrowed the American idea of a parade to showcase Chinese culture. So this Chinese parade has gone on since the 1800s. Today, it is more than a mile long um, parade route where you have over a thousand volunteers from all over the Bay Area, Chinese schools, merchants, uh, you have big companies like Salesforce um, and supermarkets become a part of the parade. We also have children who are part of the parade too. Here are a couple of kids that were stilt walkers walking through the mile long uh, route. This is another stilt walker. She is an ancient noble woman in this photograph. This is the year of the ox. And unfortunately, San Francisco did not host its parade for the very first time. So it stationed uh, many uh, different oxen around the city so people could um, enjoy watching them and doing like a scavenger hunt, finding them around the city. The ox represents hard work, perseverance and honesty. Now, Lunar New Year is not the only um, big festival. We also in the fall have the moon festival. And this is um, a TV anchor for the Chinese channel. Her name is Maggie Wong with her friend. I don't know if any of you have heard of Bruce Lee, but he was um, a very famous Kung Fu action hero. And he died in his early 30s. If he were alive today, he'd be 80 years old. And before he came on the scene in the 1970s, Chinese males had no role models. Well. This is Jeff Chin. When Jeff was a boy, he was picked on because he was Chinese. And one night after a difficult day in middle school, he looked at the Bruce Lee poster hanging on the wall of his bedroom. And he felt like the action hero was calling out to him, giving him hope. He told Bruce Lee that night he would make him proud. Well, today, Jeff is one of the top collectors of Bruce Lee memorabilia with over 10,000 items, including the suit he wore in Enter the Dragon. And portions of his collection have traveled to Smithsonian and Washington, D.C. Next, we're here at Skylon Memorial Park. This area is the Ritz-Carlton of cemeteries. And every spring, Taoist priests and families come by the busload during Qingming. It's a holiday to honor dead ancestors. And these priests, these Taoist priests that are here, are here to bless that area. Now, my photographer, um, Dick Evans, and I got a tour of the premises with amazing vistas. And it was such a contrast because in the 1800s, Chinese could not be buried in the same cemeteries as other races. Chinese were pushed outside of San Francisco to be buried in their own cemeteries. But now things have really changed. Tai Chi is a Chinese tradition. And so from early morning exercise to vibrant performances, you'll see different um, people doing Chinese Tai Chi all over the place. Now, during the photography shoot for this book, we discovered an international Tai Chi day uh, was happening in April. So we scheduled a Tai Chi shoot for this very uh, bridge right here. We're able to find uh, Kung Fu uh, Shifu Shen, Fen Xiao willing to demonstrate her Tai Chi positions in front of murals and other landmarks on the streets of Chinatown. We're here with the Tong family at Chinatown's Far East Cafe. And this is called a red egg and ginger party. And every baby that's born at one month old, a family will host such a party for um, a little boy or a little girl. You have to have a plate of dyed red eggs to represent fertility. And you also have to have a plate of ginger, what represents energy and strength. I think it's the kids who love Chinese New Year the most. You typically give two red envelopes to children or to single people filled with two fresh bills. Um, and they have to be two because you want double happiness. Now, when a girl grows up and gets engaged, the bride-to-be will order a custom tailored Cheng Sam to wear for the wedding. Meanwhile, the tea ceremony is another treasured tradition, but fewer and fewer Chinese couples are honoring it. So we were running all over town trying to find a couple that was doing Chinese tea ceremony. Well, we found Liana and Michael 
here at um, their wedding rehearsal. They will present tea to their elders and in turn, the parents and grandparents, one couple at a time, will offer them money and jewelry. Brides aren't the only ones who get jewelry. Many times an older woman will start handing down her heirlooms to her granddaughter, daughter, or daughter-in-law when she feels the time is right. In ancient times, people believed if you wore a 24 karat gold necklace or a jade bracelet, you would be protected from evil spirits. So Chinese jewelry is unique because not only is it ornamental, many people believed then that it possessed powers and Chinese jewelry has been also used as barter, as money during times of war. Now I love this mural and unfortunately it's no longer up, but I love it because it depicts everyday Chinese life, Chinatown life. Here you see a modern woman passing a traditional tailor shop in the back. And on her wrist, you see she's wearing a traditional jade bracelet, probably from her mother or grandmother. And she carries a bag of good luck oranges and box of everyday treats for a sweet life because you know you never go empty handed. This is my family sharing dim sum with my mother and my sister, my husband, and nephew. It's called going to yum cha in Cantonese tradition. Little plates of chicken feet and steamed tripe and gizzards are not exotic, but everyday dishes. So please, on the chat box, tell us what your favorite food is. Well, this is Portsmouth Square. And this is called the living room of Chinatown because the people that live in Chinatown don't have regular houses. They're in very cramped quarters. So what do they do? They come here every day to play cards, to, um, to visit with one another. And here during a rainy day, this rain did not stop a card game that was going on. Uh, Dick Evans saw that uh, it started raining. He thought he'd have to pack up his camera, but no, the card game went on and people just opened up their umbrellas. This is a Saturday morning uh, Mahjong game. And this is taking place at one of the Benevolent Family Association meeting halls. A very proud community spirit is evident at the annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant. Now, why was there a Miss USA Chinatown pageant? Because for years, Chinese American women were excluded. There was a rule in the Miss um, USA pageant saying that no one of color could be a contestant. And so Chinatown held its own pageant. So not only are they judged on poise and beauty, young women are judged on achievement. For example, this is um, Catherine Wu, Miss Chinatown of 2019. And she um, is also an Olympic level archer. A similar story of exclusion happened with the YMCA. People in Chinatown could, got, could not go outside to other YMCAs for exercise. So Chinatown had to build its own. And this is the only swimming pool in Chinatown. Here is a, a tile dragon mural outside the new Chinese hospital. In the early uh, days, you Chinese people could not go uh, outside of Chinatown to an American hospital or get a, American medical services because they refused to serve them and also uh, they couldn't communicate with them. So Chinese raised their own money and raised money for um, a hospital. This is the densest neighborhood outside of Manhattan. It's one fifth of a square mile and houses anywhere from 15,000 to 30,000 people. So imagine your home is the size of a closet and that closet is shared with four other people. So this is single renter occupancy or SRO apartments. You have no access to washers or dryers. So that's, that's why these clothes are hanging outside because you have to hand wash and hand dry your clothes. One of Chinatown's heroes is Reverend Norman Fong. And he was formerly the executive director of the Chinatown Community Development Center that owns several SROs. And on the day of this photo shoot, a young lady lived, who lives there, she ran up to him and asked if he would visit her grandmother 
her grandmother was too sick to walk down the stairs to visit the doctor. So again, there are no elevators or modern conveniences here. So the family wanted Reverend Fong to come and pray for her. So with a lot of compassion and tenderness, he took both her hands in his and whispered a prayer in Chinese. So this is one of my favorite photos because we were there to witness just this, this deed of love and compassion and action. Now from old to young, if you're on the dragon boat racing team from Community Youth Center, all your gear, your practice time is free of charge. Thanks to CYC, a nonprofit, the sports transforming the lives of at-risk kids who might be tempted to join the wrong crowd. This is Bella Chen, and she admits she was completely unathletic before joining. Her friend got her to join dragon boat racing, and now she's the team captain. Today, many Chinese kids are very proud of their heritage. Yuhan Chen is only six years old here, and she picks up a brush for the first time at this Chinese New Year event. And she finds out that she's really good at Chinese calligraphy. And if you've ever tried, Chinese calligraphy is really difficult. Here is Tyler Pham, and he's sampling dragon beard candy. Now, this was considered a um, dessert of ancient Chinese emperors. It's made from one block of solid syrup and it's pulled apart like a ballet in the air into thousands of strands like taffy and it is delicious. Now these colorful buildings I wanna tell you are not just ornamental. These are the buildings um, called family association buildings. There's more than 200 of them in Chinatown. And you can see they're painted in colorful um, colors, green, red, and yellow are considered good luck colors in Chinese. Back in the 1800s, if you landed in Chinatown, you would look up your association based on village or the last name, and the village would help you secure a place to stay or a job. And here you have shrines, which are very typical inside uh, these cl private clubhouse rooms. They're not open to the public, so you can't see them. Uh, getting in to take pictures was really rare for us. You have to know somebody who knows somebody, then you need approval by all the elders of the association to come. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, there was a play called King of the Yees, and it was about family associations. So it was a comedy, and it came to San Francisco. The comedy was written by Lauren Yi, who's now in New York. She grew up in San Francisco's Chinatown and spent many years attending association functions. So this was a parody on the family associations. The largest of these associations is called the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association of America. It's been around since the gold rush days. It was established to be kind of a uh, a council, they would settle disputes, they would help people get established, they would write letters in your name. They also had hired attorneys to represent Chinese. Now, uh, they work on all kinds of um, activities. Here's Aaron Peskin, one of the San Francisco supervisors on the left. They worked with officials to block marijuana shops from coming into Chinatown. Now, the largest um, problem isn't that, it's um, about the future because a lot of their sons do not want to take over leadership and women are not allowed to take over leadership in these family associations. You can see they're mostly run by elder men. What's going to happen to them is up in the air. Now this older lady is Cecilia Chang and she recently passed away at 100 a few uh, months ago and she was considered the Julia Child of Chinese cuisine. Back in 1968, she opened up the very first elegant and successful Chinese restaurant called the Mandarin. And it was not based in Chinatown, but based outside in a place called Ghirardelli Square, a tourist area. Now, the reason she couldn't get into Chinatown, she really wanted to. Well, she didn't speak Cantonese. She spoke Mandarin and that blocked her. And also she was a woman that also prevented her from coming in. But however, she was very successful with the Mandarin. 
people from all over the world came. There, she entertained presidents and dignitaries, movie stars and musicians. Her son, Philip, caught the restaurant bug also, and he is the co-founder of P.F. Chang's with restaurants all over the world. Now, back in the 1800s, Chinese schools were erected because parents feared their children would lose the language and culture of the homeland. The youth learned Cantonese, the language of the Guangdong province, where most Chinese were from. And now kids are learning Mandarin, which is the national language of China. Now, speaking of culture, we have music and dance in Chinese culture of all forms. And you have formal Chinese opera to Forbidden City Follies to aerobic lion dances. And they play an important role in Chinatown's identity. So setting up elaborate backdrops, and it took three hours of makeup preparation to go into this Chinese opera performance. Now, the photographer Dick Evans was very lucky to be invited backstage in the dressing room to photograph the three hours of preparation before the opera performance. And that perspective made the scene really dramatic. And let me tell you, my husband used to go to these operas with his mom when he was a child. And one day he went backstage after the performance was over. And when he saw them taking off their makeup and realized these were real people, he, he was just blown away. Now we have another type of performance. Um, there was an era in the 1940s until the 1970s, which was the nightclub era in Chinatown. People would go out for a night on the town and go to all these different nightclubs and see um, Chinese American dancers like Fred Astaire and people singing like Bing Crosby. These are Chinese Americans singing in English. And these are ladies called the Grant Street Follies. They're from that era and they're in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s. And they still perform today um, at benefits, Chinese clubs, and they practice for three hours every week. Can you imagine? So they have a great time and they still are fabulous. Now we have lion dancing. And one of our kids in elementary school, we did a presentation, they said, what's the difference between a lion and dragon? Well, a lion has a round head. A dragon has a long snout. So next time you're wondering, just remember that it's the nose and the, and the shape of the face. So these lion heads look like they're easy to lift, but they're actually 10 pounds or more. So you sur surely have to practice and moving it around you're not just like shaking it around, you're mimicking a real lion. So if you haven't practiced, you won't last through a whole parade. You really need to consider what the, how the lion would move and act. This man is named Corey Chan. He's a lion head restorer. He takes damaged lion heads and he's been doing it for over 40 years and repairs them. And I say he gives them back the roar. He's simply self-taught and he replaces the eyelid strings that would be used for blinking. He glues on the new fur. He paints over scratches until the lion looks like brand new again. After repairs, he says the new memories come back to the lion and these are really stunning. He collects them all in his garage and instead of putting car cars in his garage, he has all these lion heads. Now to many visitors, a Chinese experience is not complete without a stop at a restaurant, bakery or a food market. And um, during the three years that Dick was working on the project and the year and a half I was working on it, we, whenever we got together, before we left, he'd say, I think let's stop by for a little treat. And we'd always go to a bakery or somewhere to pick up something to eat because food is such a huge part of Chinese culture. And it's a huge part of going to Chinatown. Yes, claps. So um, we wanna show you a few slides of um, 
the wonderful delis and bakeries. Here you have roasted ducks. And not only are they at the old school delis, but they're at these new restaurants. And here is China Live. We, uh, it is a modern restaurant. And so we talk about gentrification. Yes, Chinatown San Francisco is also always uh, on the threat, on the verge of gentrification. But the new guard of new restaurants and old restaurants can, can coexist with one not dominating the other. I love this picture of um, this woman stirring um, chocolate mousse. And in this kitchen, there is not one freezer. And the chef told me, I don't wanna have frozen food that's been thawed. There's no freezer here because what we cook today is what we serve. And so that gives you an idea of how fresh everything is. This is a very upscale um, restaurant named Mr. Jews, the one you saw on the cover of our book. And it um, earned a Michelin star, one of the highest ratings you can get as a restaurant six months after they opened. It's got striking ambiance. Um, you can see how precise these dishes look and how neat and tidy everything looks. Here we have Kathy Fang. And I love this woman. She um, is the daughter of uh, owners of a, another restaurant called House of Nanking. And she grew up in Chinatown. And she grew up just um, seeing how her parents worked so hard. She went to chef school, got her um, degree and culinary certificate. She's also been on Food Network and on the show Chopped a few times. She's been a chop champion twice. So I hope you get to go to her restaurant in the city. It's called Fang. We also have the old guard, as I said before. <clears throat> this is a little Chinese deli called Mo Li Shinki. And it's a business of dried meats and poultry. That little store is over 100 years old and it spans seven generations. And the question now is, is the next generation going to take over? I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but this is dried fish, salted fish. And for me, it's a really precious food memory. And I hope you put your Chinese food memories in our chat box. Um, it's called Ham Yi, and I love it. Whenever I stayed at my grandmother's uh, studio apartment near Chinatown, Popo would steam this um, over rice with lap chan, which is sausage, for breakfast, it was delicious. If you ever go to Chinatown in San Francisco, you have to go to a place called Eastern Bakery. Eastern Bakery makes a specialty cake and this is coffee crunch cake. It's only one of two places in San Francisco that makes it, the other is in Japantown, but it's a layer of mocha frosting covered by bits of coffee crunch candy. This is um, a street, a common produce market on a street called Stockton Street. That's called the local Chinatown, whereas Grant Avenue with all the pagoda rooftops, <clears throat> that's the tourist Chinatown. But here, two blocks up is a local Chinatown where every day at four o'clock, the little grandmas emerge from their SRO apartments and they um, sell produce on sale. And they cry out, yet mun, yet bao, one dollar, one bag. And there's one thing that unites us Chinese through the ages. We all love a good bargain. So next time you go to Chinatown, go at four o'clock and go to one of these produce centers. <clears throat> You'll also see dried roots and fungi on the streets. And you probably see them in the Chinatown in New York as well. And what are they used for? These are ingredients in a healthy family soup recipe. You take a fistful of this and a finger full of that. You never use a measuring cup, just, just by the fist. And a Chinese soup can clear acne. It can fortify your chi. It can improve your circulation. It can cure infertility. Now, a traditional Cantonese mother cooks soup daily for her family. Unfortunately, I'm not a traditional Cantonese mother, but my, my mother was, and so was my grandmother. 
Now we have a section of our beautiful entrepreneurs, proud, hardworking people. The entrepreneurs and small family businesses are the lifeblood of Chinatown's economy. There's more, there were more than 450 in Chinatown, just 26 square blocks. Yes, it's been impacted by the pandemic. But here's hardworking 83 year old Tain Chen. She founded, owns and operates the walk shop on Grant Avenue. And even though the COVID shutdown, her business was thriving. And why was that? Because years ago, her son got her to go online. So she has her own online walk shop store where people every day place orders. And so during the pandemic, she went to the shop every day to package up her walks for shipment. We have a variety of small businesses. Here we have an herbalist that has survived the decades. There's always been an herbalist in Chinatown because Chinese people back in the day did not trust Western medicine. They trusted what they knew in the homeland and that was herbs and soups, things that they were recognizable, things that would also prevent disease, not just try to cure it. <clears throat> we have Shirley Yu, who is a florist here of Sweetheart Florist. And when we went there, she was just so happy to show off her little space of beautiful flowers that she arranges every day, doing all the funeral wreaths, wedding bouquets, and anything you need. The studio photographer is just one of the many people in Chinatown running a small business. He is taking photos of um, presidents and heads of state, um, has done many wedding banquets and 90 year old birthday parties. We also have an acupuncturist um, who is here. The day I came, um, I interviewed him and I actually had wanted him to like do a photo shoot with me and like prick me in the hand or something. And he refused. He said, no, 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 no. You only come here for treatment. I will not stage putting a needle in you. <laughs> so um, he showed us just um, how thankful he was. Many of his customers were not Chinese. They are um, people from all walks of life, all nationalities who found that Chinese medicine really works for them. And so not only is he acupuncturist, he's also an herbalist as well. I love this gal, her name is Alice Leong. She is um, the daughter of uh, Mr. Leong who had passed away, who also owned this Red Blossom Tea Company. Now, when she took over, she totally revamped the space. She modernized everything. And she realized the old guard, when her dad was in business, the Chinese men and women would come and pick up the regular um, tea orders. They knew their teas already because these are all Chinese customers. But when she took over, she realized a lot of the newer generation did not understand teas. They wanted to learn about tea. So she revamped the business and she set up tea tastings, very much like a wine tasting. So she would pour different teas, have people smell it, talk about what temperature to brew the water. She did an entire tea education, which is fabulous. So go to Red Blossom Tea Company if you go. But um, she also was very smart. She was a finance major in college. She left her corporate work to come run the tea company. And also she um, <clears throat> has corporate accounts in places like Google. So my husband works at Google. So when I went there, I saw the Rib Blossom Tea Company jar and I was thrilled. So she figured out a way to make it work for um, this new century. This is um, a jade shop and antiquity shop. And at this time, this store has gone out of business. Uh, what I wanted to say is that these are historic stores. Early on in Chinatown, you couldn't get this stuff. There was no internet. You couldn't go to even go to China because it was closed. So these imports were extremely precious. So when people wanted to come and do interiors with an Asian theme, they had to go to Chinatown. And this is where they would get their antiquities and their carvings. Now you can buy any of this stuff on the internet. 
And so this store, this uh, woman here, she is not the owner, she's the, the niece, her uncle's store, she would come on weekends just to help out. So that kind of gives you a slice of history that these types, even these types of souvenir stores are no longer relevant. Now, what is relevant, this is Cindy Chen Wong, and she's hoping that being part of the new guard, her type of souvenir store is what will attract people. She knows people are foodies. Everything she cooks at a restaurant, people want to know how to make it. So she has ordered and curated this beautiful shop of Asian um, cookery and pots and mugs and local artists who have made um, paintings um, and artwork into the shop and it's gorgeous and it's uncluttered. So she's kind of the new wave of entrepreneur that is in Chinatown today. Here is a boutique called um, Kim Plus Ono, and they sell Chinese kimonos that are hand painted from China and shipped over here. Now here is an image of that store. And we wanted to um, show this last image. Oh yeah, the store. I just wanted to say one thing about the store is that the gal that runs the store, she learned about um, retail because her parents seven souvenir stores in Chinatown. And she learned about retail from growing up in these stores. But when she had her own opportunity to open up her own, she went online first. And then as her online store uh, became very popular, then she opened the brick and mortar store, which is now um, hoping to do better and um, is, has stunning work. Now we move to our last slide um, for the slideshow, which is a mural found inside Dim Sum Corner. This is a mural that was in, in the corner in the back near the bathroom, and it took up an entire wall. So it's about maybe like eight feet high. But we picked it as our last image because here you have um, this traditional Chinese gal, but she has a modern vibe and she's taking a picture. So you're looking at her, but actually she's looking out at you. And we feel that there's a lot of hope for Chinatown that it looks out towards the future. And um, that is how we find Chinatown. Even though it's struggling right now, as many Chinatowns are, um, there is hope for the future because it is a community that has withstood suffering, but it's been resilient and celebrates its heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for such a, a fascinating lecture. Um, so uh, before we, uh, we move on to um, the q and I'd like to remind the audience that you can support the Chinese community uh, in San Francisco by uh, purchasing this book. So um, this, is, this is the book. Oh, okay. I'm I'm sorry. It's not showing on from my end. I'm trying to show you the book, but somehow my video, my webcam doesn't doesn't show it uh, exactly. Um, so, um, so the book sales uh, would would uh, will be donated to the Chinese Cultural Center uh, and benefit Chinatown businesses which have been affected by the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, we are going to, uh, you can order the book by visiting www.chinatownbooksf.com slash order. So um, our club president uh, just posted the link in the chat. So you can see the chat in the link. And also the link is available on the flyer that you received for this event. Um, okay, so, um, the book is also available on Amazon. Okay, so it's it's a cheaper on Amazon as usual. And all right, so um, now we're going to move on to uh, to the Q and A. Uh, let's see. Um, so Kathy, is that is that what you want to do? We're going to move on to the Q and A. Okay, sure. okay. So I have seen some questions on the chat already. Um, 
All right, so you can also type your questions in the chat or you just type your name in the chat so I can call your name and so you can ask your question. All right, let's see this question uh, from Christina. With the cultural appropriation being a conversation brought to the forefront of a society within the last decade, what, what is the sentiment of wearing jade items like bracelets? If you do not come from the background, um, if you understand the meaning, the history and the respect, the culture, what is the overall sentiment? I, um, I think, you know, nowadays because jade has become so prevalent also in um, mainstream jewelry stores, I, I don't think that anyone would think that it's disrespectful if you're not Chinese and don't know about the um, the you know the tradition behind it or the the symbolism behind it I feel like you know now people just see it as regular jewelry um, even in China and in uh, you know Hong Kong people would wear all kinds of jewelry and not think anything of it um, Professor Gao what do, what do you think about that. Um, you know, interestingly, I personally, I don't like jade, but I it's become very popular in China, jade, mm -hmm. and people, you know, purchase jade because jade has the increase in value. Mm -hmm. And also, the, you know, the Chinese believe uh, that jade can prevent you from illness. It's a mm -hmm. sort of protection if you wear jade. Right. Um, yeah, that's what I heard. Professor, I was taught by my my dad and my grandmother, like when I was really young, that jade protects you from like evil spirits too. And like, mm -hmm. it's a symbol of wealth too. Like if you have a, I have a really nice jade piece. It's really big. So wow. I wear it around my neck too all, all day long. Like it never I never take it off, but I was taught that it, either you're, it, it's both. So like it protects you from evil spirits, illness, and it's basically a sign of wealth too, because my jade piece is not cheap. It's real, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, you know, I heard that once you wear it, you, you, you shouldn't take it off. You should keep wearing it. Because I don't know, like a lot of Chinese people, like they think, <laughs> they think that you, like your body builds a bond with it. That's what they, like, that's what I've heard all of my life. Your body builds a bond with the piece of, the piece of jade that you have around your neck. Whether that be a ra bracelet, I know people have rings, um anklet whatever you body build a bond with it so well my um my mother and grandmother would always say the more you wear your jade the greener it gets yes it's that's what my mom said too your luster yeah so and that's true no it's actually my jade got very it's like definitely darkened over time like it was that's super it? light when i got it and now it's like it's really sort like areas of it is like super super dark green yeah yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. Okay, so uh, th I, I, I'm not sure whether this is a question. This is from Beverly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's about white rice. Why uh, is the white rice also an American Chinese thing? If so, what, what is the most popular rice for the traditional ch Chinese population? I think it's long grain white rice, in fact, um, my grandfather, when he uh, came here, he went, uh, sent money to my grandmother to buy a house and she brought property. And on the property were rice paddies and the rice paddies uh, were very abundant. And my uncle remembers growing up in the rice paddies and going to shuck the rice. And he said, there is nothing as good as fresh rice from the field. So it is traditional, that long grain white rice that is traditional through rice patties throughout. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. fresh rice. Um, I've never but... had fresh, fresh. I, I think <laughs> I could only imagine how good that is. Yeah, you know, the best, the best white rice I had was in Japan. <laughs> Interestingly, it was really? in Japan. You know, the rice, white rice in Japan tastes so deliciously. I think it has something to do with their soil. Um, yeah. you know, in Japan, uh, I think it mostly because it was fresh, you know, yeah. it was 
fresh. It was really, really fresh, huh? Yeah, right. I put a lot of sauce on my white rice to give it flavor too. Like, put no, a you never do that. I had my American friend come over. She put butter on it and soy sauce. No, 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 I can't believe no, no. you do that, Sarah. No, no, no. Well, you take the the sauce from like either choy or like if you're stir frying lobster, the way can the Cantonese do it with chives and garlic, uh, scallion garlic chives. The way the Chinese do, the way the Cantonese people do it, you put that sauce on the rice. Oh my God, so good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see this question uh, from Hannah. All right. Even though San Francisco Chinatown was rebuilt as a tourist town. It seems like the members of the community are very close, giving the living room of Chinatown. Would you say that the Chinatown community is a tight knit? Mm -hmm. It is very, very, very tight knit, even today. When I was a little girl, a uh, long time ago, centuries ago, you go to Chinatown and all the ladies that would go, if you, you we would live in the community next door to Chinatown would come in, all the ladies would carry red envelopes like this one in their purse, okay? And they always have it filled with money because you know you're gonna bump into a girlfriend or another grandma and you, you pull out your red envelope to, you say, hey, give this to your grandchild, give this to your kid, or you see a little kid. So everyone knew each other. And when I was working on the book, I remember I would see the merchants. I would be there like at least like several times a week. After a while, I started recognizing the people and I would say hi to them. So it's very small. It's like one, one fifth of a square mile. So there's only a few blocks that you go to. So you figure if you work there every day, you're gonna see the same people over and over. You're gonna eat the same restaurants over and over. So they all help each other. And it's, um, it's, a, really, it's a really good, wonderful community. Okay, next question. Um, so what about people of non-Asian community using traditional Chinese wardrobe uh, as a fashion, such as the people like the uh, Kardashians? <laughs> uh, is, it, is it more disrespectful or is it something that you think brings attention to traditional Chinese culture? I think, you know, it, it um... I think everyone just can have a different opinion on that. I think that what that tells me is instead of saying, Chinese, go back to your homeland, we don't want anything to do with you, it shows me that people are embracing Chinese culture, adapting um, different types of cultures and pieces um, to adapt to themselves. So. You know, like when you go to Chipotle and you, you get a burrito, I'm sure it's very different from the burrito you're going to get in Mexico, but it's been adapted, right, to American taste. So to me, I just feel like, you know, it shows how far the Chinese culture has come. Um, the fact that when things go mainstream, you can go to Safeway, the supermarket now, and you can buy oyster sauce. You know, we couldn't do that before. We couldn't get ginger root inside a traditional market. That's why we had to go to Chinatown every single week. So the fact that the Chinese have been here and been able to, the culture has been able to be embraced and there are Chinese in all walks of life in all professions. Every, you have Chinese Americans who are astronauts for NASA. You, they're not just doctors and lawyers anymore. They're in all aspects. And I think um, we should all be very proud of that. Okay, so here's a comment. It's not a question. I like to read out, read it to uh, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kathy, and all. Uh, the last, the last thing I would ever want to do is disrespect the culture. I find the the meaning behind it to be ever so interesting. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. Um, okay, a question from Don regarding that jewelry art store, you said that it was not easily found uh, at other stores. And then you said, and I didn't hear it clearly what you said, that now you, you can find these stuffs online. Um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. so, so yeah. So what I was saying is that particular store 
there used to be many, many jewelry stores and um, Chinese artifact stores. You know, if you want to get um, a jade carving, some kind of little statue, they were all over Chinatown before pre-internet because that was the only place you could buy them. And, you know, mainstream stores didn't carry this stuff. But now because of the internet, you can buy any of these pieces online pretty much or knockoffs you know who knows if it's authentic or not but you could buy it online and online has really hurt the souvenir vendors a lot so um the people that would buy this stuff out of necessity are buying it online people who buy this stuff now are tourists who want to get something from chinatown to say hey i bought this in chinatown and so they would buy it but the bigger um the ideas of you know, the Chinese chairs and the furnitures and the big beds. I used to carry huge things, you know. Now there's no need to do that. So, and also I think people's design tastes have changed too. You know, they don't, they won't, may not want that kind of thing. It's, they want farmhouse modern, you know. So um, that's also hurt business. And plus the next generation, these merchants, they squirreled away all their money for their kids so they could go to college. They don't want their kids to work in Chinatown, you know? So then what's going to happen after they retire? That's a big question. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question related to the, you know, the jewelry um, store. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, is it possible to buy qi pao, the traditional Chinese dress in Chinatown? Yes. There's several tailors that will still tailor it for you. Oh, but you okay. Also buy it on the internet too. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah, you can I I bought mine in um in uh Chinatown. I had it tailor made for me when I was getting married. It doesn't fit anymore, but at that time it did. <laughs> so okay. Is that is that expensive if you you know get it tailor made? Have it tailored made, yeah. Oh, uh, probably more expensive than if you were buying it on the rack. You could buy it on the rack now for like mm -hmm. less than a hundred dollars. You can buy it even cheaper online. But you know, something really special quality made is, is better to get it tailor made. Good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Um the next question. Um yeah from Ari. She um uh, our former president of the club. Uh with the COVID-19 on the rise do you think a Chinese business that went out of the business might have a comeback? If so, how do you think they will do in the future? Um, yeah, so, you know, before, before we, um, I'd like you move on to, to answer this, answering this, uh, this question, I'm just wondering how, how the Chinese community, how the, has the Chinese community been uh, affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? socially and economically well they've been economically just devastated devastated um health wise they've been okay so what was really interesting remember last january around this time last january chinatown all of a sudden became a ghost town because they you know there's this the wuhan virus right before it was a pandemic it was the wuhan virus so everyone stayed away from anything Chinese. Even Chinese restaurants that would be in New Jersey would be empty. Okay, anything Chinese would not be frequented. So Chinatown all of a sudden becomes a ghost town in January before everything. That already hurt business. Um, but you know there was warnings to wear masks. So everyone was, and Chinese people are a people of survival. So we're, we're in other country areas of the US where people refuse to wear masks because of independence and I need my rights. Chinese people want to survive. So if you tell them you need to do this if you want to stay alive, they did it. In addition, those SROs I told you about where they have shared kitchens, some nonprofits raised money so that the elderly didn't have to use the shared kitchens and spread germs. So they gave them dinner tickets they went to the local restaurants using their free dinner vouchers and they got meals almost like four days a week so they could spread out their food. They wouldn't have to cook, which was great. 
So there was no outbreak. Like they may have like small, maybe one or two small outbreaks, but no like giant outbreak. And you can imagine how cramped those places were, right? Four, five, six people in one room. And those rooms are all next to each other like dominoes. There was a lot of potential for a huge outbreak, but there wasn't because the community banded together and they, they, they saved Chinatown. Mm. There's over 200 nonprofits that somehow affect Chinatown. Nonprofits to help kids with after school homework, nonprofits to um, give free medical care you know, to the elderly. So everything within Chinatown actually is, is really to, to save them, to, to protect them. There's so many good services there. I mean, at the Donna Dina Cameron House that once had rescued girls that were trafficked, it did not shut down. As it saw the need was less and less, they changed into offering after school programs for kids who had nowhere to go after school. And they changed, they offer youth camps. And then they offer um, counseling for people who have been diagnosed with cancer. A lot of Chinese don't know how to talk about illness, right? And so they would have like support groups in Chinese and in Mandarin and Cantonese for people who had cancer. So a lot of really relevant services affect Chinatown. There's even a school called the Newcomer School. And if you're like in elementary school and you come here for the first time, you can co go there to the newcomer school, a public school for one year, and you get services for an entire school year. They'll teach you about how to assimilate into America. They'll talk to the parents about what is a field trip? What is a permission slip? Um, you know, they'll, they'll really help you adjust. And after that one year there, then they transition you to a regular public school. So really wonderful, wonderful services in Chinatown for every age bracket. Wow, those are services are very impressive. Yeah, very impressive. Yeah. Even the Chinese <laughs> hospitals serves juk, serves Chinese food as ho as hospital food. So it's it's really wonderful. I wonder how good the juk is though. I don't know. Hey, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're we're going back, come back, coming back to our uh, Aries question. Uh, do you? Do you think a Chinese business that went out of business might have a comeback? If so, how do you think they will do in the future? It really depends on, um, you know, there's some stimulus packages that are being offered right now. That picture of the red egg and ginger party in that restaurant, um, they, that was Far East Cafe and they're a hundred years old. So it was on the news that they were going out of business. They were gonna serve their last meal on, on New Year's Eve. So anyway, the community rallied together and somehow they got some stimulus money and they're staying open now just on weekends. So with the help of the community, some businesses are staying open. The Dragon Beard Candy store I showed you was this tiny, the guy couldn't make rent. So he, he closed up. He may not come back. He came, he was an engineer, a young guy. He wanted to pass on the Dragon Beard County tradition because very few people know how to do it. There's only like two places in the US that offer the candy. So he would make it in his window and everything. And then when the pandemic hit, I went back down to Chinatown to, to try to see him. And he was closed and he just had a phone number. So if you wanna order it, here's my phone number, but um, he may not come back. So a lot of these places that closed they were on the brink of retiring anyway. So some places said, oh, I'm just gonna close. I was gonna retire anyway. So, um, you know, Far East Cafe staying open because the public wants it open. So the ones that are like really visible, getting press and getting some money, they'll stay open. The ones that are about to retire, they're gonna close. But the thing is, most of the real estate in Chinatown is either owned by the family association or owned by Chinese partnerships. So they're owned by Chinese. So most of them really care about what goes into Chinatown. And because of these 200 nonprofits that have everything from the arts to social services, if you put in something like Starbucks in Chinatown, they will pick at you. There was one landlord that rented out one of her um, rooms, one of her storefronts to um, one of those shared workspaces type of places. 
And um, she, this gal that opened it up, she was run out of Chinatown because people felt like she was not culturally relevant. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of controversy there, but there's a lot of voices in Chinatown. So whoever comes in next will have to uh, fit into the community. The community will want to make sure you're culturally relevant. So hopefully that will prevent a lot of gentrification from happening. Okay. All right. Thank you for that question. Okay. So, um, all right. So the next question from Beverly. Uh, with this lecture, I have learned that Chinese people have experienced the level of historical discrimination. I heard you refer to being brown when you were dis describing not Chinese women not being able to participate in the Miss American pageant. Is the Chinese population considered a part of a melanated uh, family? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you rephrase? Okay, it? Uh, Beverly, would you would you mind to just um, rephrase your phrase or your question um, differently, or you want to just ask the quest, uh, Kathy this question directly? You can ask it out loud. Yeah, you can unmute yourself, Beverly. I think she's asking whether or not Chinese people are considered like brown people the same way South Asian folks are. Oh, brown? I don't- Yeah, I don't, brown. Like the color brown? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I, do you want me to repeat the question? Okay, yeah, so yeah, I think- no, I understand seems... what it means, like considered brown, like, like Hispanic or like in the same category? Uh, yeah. I don't think so. What do you think, Professor Gao? It, it, whether we're considered brown? Yeah. I kind of don't I, think- I've like, heard that, you know, they categorize the Asians as a uh, uh, brown, you know, we are, um, yeah, in the, in, in the race of a brown. I have heard that. Um, I, the only reference point I have is, um, during the civil rights movement, we had a relative, uh, an older relative who um, was living in Alabama. And during that time, everything, the blacks were put in the back of the bus. And so when she got on the bus, she was kind of darker skin. They made her sit in the back of the bus. And she kept saying, I'm Chinese, I'm not black. And they, and they just said back of the bus. So you're either white or not white. And so back of the bus, you, you sip from the, the Negro fountain for the water. Uh, you sit in the back of the restaurant. So at that time, it was very clear that Chinese were part of the other, you know? Um, so regarding that is, uh, yeah, I have, I, for myself, I don't feel like I've been categorized as brown, but I have been, you know, uh, there are a lot of subtle cues of racism, like when Chinatown, during the height of the COVID, you know, even my own family said, oh, I'm not going to Chinatown, I'm not going to go near there, I can catch COVID. And I kept telling them, you have a lot of misunderstanding, you can't catch it just by stepping into Chinatown. So there was a lot of, um, and there can be racism by just avoiding people, you know, or what's you know, racist thoughts. It doesn't have to be overt, right? To be racist. You can just have racist thoughts of yeah, absolutely. how you cast people in your own mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, um, all right, this is, um, what is the difference between the authentic Chinese food versus American Chinese food? Ah, interesting. <sighs> I'll tell you, I don't like, fusion. I don't really care. I either want it like Chinese food or American food. So I think it's the ingredients uh, and not just the ingredients, like there's like techniques, right? There's techniques. So the gal that uh, you saw, Kathy Fang in the orange shirt. So she, um, when I visited her and she was cooking, 
the and she presented we were doing a photo shoot so she's like she goes okay I'll, let me cook a few dishes for you like she did in five minutes and she whipped together this noodle dish and um it was like it was so good and then like a month later i went to the same restaurant ordered the same thing she um whoever was the cook used the same ingredients and it wasn't as good so i think it all depends on on like the quality of food really depends on the chef and um you know the technique and the ingredients like using like the real ingredients like real garlic not garlic salt you know using fresh fresh ingredients that they would do in in hong kong and china you know how they cook then they didn't have all this powdered stuff or preserved stuff or you know synthesized ingredients so i think that's the, the difference i think you are right kathy um i think you know the ingredients and the techniques and the sauce you know, I think American Chinese food, you know, that, uh, that's cooked at a, a Chinese restaurant here. The sauce is pre-made, right? Yes. So they just, you know, they just uh, uh, boil, um, they, they boil the vegetables or, you know, meat or whatever, uh, you know, I mean, in, in the oil, then they just dump the sauce. Just, um, it's, yeah. it seems like it's just, uh, it's more close to fast food. The, the American Chinese food here is more close to, uh, a fast food. So when you cook food so quickly, you know, it, it compromises the flavor. So I think it's authentic, you know, I, I don't mean to downplay the American Chinese food, but I think it's authentic Chinese food takes longer to cook. Mm -hmm. You know, you put more preparation, you put more, you know, uh, you know, the timing, where you put first, where you put second. So um, then the food tastes, it, yeah, it is more tasty you know, when you put more uh, preparation into it. Yeah, and you know, what's sad is that if you're so used to like the, the Chinese fast food, you think that's your standard. So my kids, you know, when they were little, they would have like Costco pot stickers. So then we'd go to a place that specializes in pot stickers, like a real Chinese restaurant, and they wouldn't like it. They go, these are not pot stickers. I go, no, these are the real kind. They go, oh no, we like the ones from Costco better. So it depends <laughs> on what, you rate, like, what your taste is right so professor my grandmother literally doesn't even know what garlic powder is she knows what salt and pepper is but all these other spices she has zero idea what they are and i grew up eating the most traditional wok fried basically she's whipping up dishes like yeah, freaking really shaking the wok with the spatula like three times a minute and you're watching her go 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 and like boom you have tw dinner in 20 minutes like that just sad. I'm sad to hear that. Like Costco pot stickers. That's disgusting. <laughs> Ling Ling. <All> right. pot <laughs> stickers. <laughs> it's disgusting. Okay. All right. So the next question you mentioned earlier that one of the reasons Cecilia Chang Zhang uh, couldn't mm -hmm. open her restaurant in Chinatown proper due to the Mandarin and the Cantonese language barrier. Do you still feel this is a rift? within the Chinese community? No, um, <clears throat> you know, in Chinatown now, um, a lot of the um, Cantonese merchants know some Mandarin. So I was doing a talk with a Mandarin group and, the, and some of the ladies said, you know, I'm afraid to go into Chinatown because I don't speak Cantonese. And majority of the vendors now, they know some Mandarin and um, you can find not just Cantonese restaurants, you can sign Sichuan restaurants, um, Hunan restaurants. So you can find uh, Chinese restaurants from all these different provinces now. And you can even find Japanese restaurant and you can even find, um, you know, Taiwanese boba tea and things like that. So it's not that much of a barrier anymore. And plus you have a lot of the, um, the landlords are younger and, uh, you know, they want people to come in especially now, they want people to use the spaces. But she was definitely uh, hurt by that. In fact, when she, when I came to meet her, at that time she had just was 99 at the time, she said, are you Cantonese speaking or Mandarin speaking? And when I said Cantonese, she just kind of put up a wall because she said, your people, your people just wouldn't let me open a restaurant in Chinatown. So there was still this, this bitterness there. 
but she was successful. You know, she had uh, Barbara president's wife, Barbara Bush would come with her secret service to um, her restaurant. She had Mick Jagger come to her restaurant. She had movie stars and so many um, celebrities come. She said she couldn't even keep a list. It was so like the phone would ring off the hook and she dressed so elegantly. In fact, she had her Cheng Soms tailor made in China and shipped to her. She had so many beautiful dresses that Neiman Marcus actually had a um, showcase of her dresses in their window for uh, one season. Very elegant woman. Okay, I think this is also part of her question. Um, okay, how do they feel that the schools went from teaching Cantonese to Mandarin? Mm. So, I think they were fine. A lot of the parents, okay, are about wanting their kids to be successful and getting ahead. And because Mandarin is a national language of China, they, they were fine. In, in fact, a lot of the Cantonese parents said, no, 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 I'll teach you Cantonese at home. You know, we'll speak it at home. But when you go to Chinese school, you learn Mandarin. So majority of them were fine. And you can still find a Cantonese school, but it's, it's harder to find. All right, question from Colin. Do the residents of uh, San Francisco's Chinatown aid Chinese or Chinese Hong Kong immigrants in establishing US residency? All right, interesting question. In order to help sustain the cultural strength of the community, uh, specifically residency in San Francisco Chinatown. Um, there's a lot of services within Chinatown that will help them establish residency. Yes. I mean, anything you need, they'll help them uh, stay here, you know, and a lot of these um, older residents, they have kids, they don't have to live there. Some of them don't have to live there. They could live out in the suburbs here where I live, but they choose to live there because everything is within a walking distance, all their friends are there. They don't, they don't mind this tiny little quarters that they live in. So uh, yes, they can establish residency. There's lots of services to help them. A lot of bilingual lawyers. So, so what is a population that lives in uh, Chinatown? Um, old or young or new, uh, you know, old, you know, uh, new immigrants? Uh, uh, quite a few um, new, new immigrants, but the existing mostly older immigrants. So the majority is, 50 and older and then if you see like a mom and her kids it's probably because she's a new immigrant you know but um to give you an idea okay the chinese hospital does not have a pediatric wing they do not have a maternity wing that would be out in the suburbs hmm. but they do a lot of cataract surgery and hip surgery so that gives you an, an idea of their clientele mostly seniors there's no, uh, you know, you're not going to find a four bedroom house, with two bathrooms and a backyard. Everything is apartment living in Chinatown, high rise yeah. apartment living. Yeah. 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 But Most I think of low income. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I okay. think similar to New York. Yeah. So Sarah might know that it's similar to, to Chinatown in New York. In the, I'm the sorry, you repeat that professor? The population in Chinatown is in Manhattan. It's, it's, it's old. It's huge. Older, older. Yes, older, yes. Older Chinese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, my grandmother literally talking, going back to groceries that like everyone goes out for their weekly Chinese groceries. My grandmother actually still goes every single day just to grab what she needs for dinner. Yeah, that's yeah. very common. You buy it mm -hmm. fresh. You, you buy it super, super fresh. Yeah, and you may have just a really tiny refrigerator. You oh know? yeah, she she doesn't even have she doesn't have the double doors. She literally just has the one, and then like a shoe box of a freezer. Yeah, yeah call it a day. Okay, we have uh, we have a few questions, several questions left. So like that's true. Let's see if I can we can go over them. Uh, I've noticed that Chinese restaurants and establishments establishments are open to bartending in in bartending and give occasional discounts. 
uh, more so than do Western establishments, which barely do that at all. Is there a reason for that? Well, you know, these restaurants, it's all relationship. If they see, if you own a restaurant and I own a restaurant, you might come in for a meal, I'll treat you. I'll go to your place, you treat me. You know, so there's this, it's community and it's almost like family, you know? Or there's this one restaurant, it's a basement restaurant. So it's like, what's cool about Chinatown is like really niche restaurants, right? You might have it like way up in the back somewhere or you can have, there's a number of basement restaurants. You have to go down the stairs, no ventilation, you know, but the best rice plates, like $8 or something. And if, if the waitress likes you, she'll give you a little cube of Jello. You know, not everybody gets it, but you know, they like you, they'll put, give you some candy. So you have these little uh, favors, you know, um, I think it happens with the people that they know. So it's all relationship. It's a community, you know, whereas restaurants around here, it's, you know, in the suburb, it's business. You do, you do business and you're not, ex it's not part of the culture to, to barter. But in Chinatown is part of the culture. You, you do like little favors for people. All right, so the next question. Uh, do you think in the future, near or far, there will ever be a time that they allow women to sit on the board of the family associations? As a Chinese woman, as a Chinese woman, how do you feel about that? You know, um, they say that, you know, a lot of the, the boards, I, I don't think they'll, not, I don't think in my lifetime, you're gonna see a woman on uh, the top boards. Now, a lot of these association will have the women's club, you know? So the women's club of the CCBA will have their own like officers and stuff like that um, and their own charities and things. Um, so how do I feel like, I, I don't feel good about it, you know, but I see like historically how it's been that way. So I don't see, that it's gonna change. I think they're gonna really like force their sons or nephews or somebody to, to step in or sometimes new immigrants will step in as well. Not everyone in these groups is old school. They have some newer, uh, newer blood. But one time I talked to a, a fellow and he said, they don't really like American born Chinese. They would rather you just be an immigrant straight from Hong Kong or China because all their minutes are written in Chinese, all their meetings are conducted in Chinese language. And one time he suggested that, um, you know, they, they have scholarship forms uh, for kids who want college scholarship because, you know, that's part of their thing is like scholarships. And uh, he said, why don't we just put it online? And he, they did not like it. They did not like the idea of being put online and they said that was like ruin their privacy so they pretty much like kicked him out of the club off of the the officers <laughs> so he said they're still really old they, they do not want to do email or technology you know but they all have cell phones but they don't they don't want to do that kind of like social media or communication so it'd be very tough All right, this question is from, uh, from Professor Levine. What are the significant differences between San Francisco's Chinatown and the New York City Chinatown or others? Hmm. Well, from what I understand at doing the book and doing my research, San Francisco Chinatown has pretty much stayed the same footprint all these years. These 24 blocks are bordered by uh, Kearney Avenue and Stockton and Broadway and, and Bush, you know, the, the, this quadrant. And then you have the outer Chinatown, which is like the next layer out where people live. And I think what's made it so unique is a lot of Chinatowns in other cities, most of them have disappeared. The one in San Jose, there used to be a Chinatown in San Jose and now it's where the San Jose Museum of Art is. And to show that there was a Chinatown, there's a little gold plaque. Um, so many, much of California had a lot of Chinatowns. And that's res been reduced. You'll see some remnant architecture. So most of them have been obliterated. 
And as I understand the New York Chinatown, a lot of art galleries have moved in and it's really kind of like spread out, not so much as concentrated as the one in San Francisco. And a lot of it's due because of the nonprofits, because of who owns the real estate and what does the real estate owner want to do with that space. Yeah. And New York City Chinatown might be a little bigger than uh, San Francisco Chinatown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've been to both. So uh, I, yeah, I think Kathy, you are right. Uh, the Chinatown in New York City is more spread, spread it. All right, so let's see this question. Uh, do you, all right, so do you know any original Chinese restaurants in New Jersey? Okay, <laughs> so, okay, so uh, I think I, I can answer this question. Yeah. <laughs> All you right. answer it, you answer it. <laughs> so, you know, there are a couple um, the Chinese rest restaurants in Monmouth County, actually. Um, they are close to authentic. I wouldn't say authentic, authentic, but they are, they are close. One is, uh, one is called West Lake, it's on Route 34 in Madawan. And the other is um, it's a restaurant uh, on Route 79, um, the Crown Palace. Okay, it's on 79 before you, uh, before you get to the, uh, the Chinese uh, supermarket, uh, Meidong uh, supermarket. And I have heard there are some authentic Chinese restaurants in Edison. Okay, wow. yeah, so they are, they are, yeah, so if you That's go to true. Edison, there are many, many restaurants, you know, Chinese, Korean. New Brunswick and Edison are the places to go for really authentic, authentic Chinese food. Crown and Westlake is where I get, Crown is where I get my dim sum. Westlake is where I get dinner takeout. But if you really want really authentic Chinese food, Edison, New Brunswick area. Yeah, Edison, okay. So, um, all right, I guess this is the last question. I think we have maybe a couple minutes for last question, uh, for the last question. Okay, with the rice, a with the rights Asian hate crimes, do you think there will be a change for the Asia, uh, Asia community? If so, how do you think they will protect the elder, elders in those community? Well, if you notice, I don't know if it made the news here, but <clears throat> there's a city called Oakland uh, next door to San Francisco <clears throat> and the Asian uh, Chinese elders have been like thrown on the ground. Uh, they've been attacked. So actually what happened was community members kind of started their own, started doing their own volunteer groups and like going parading the streets to protect the citizens because there was not enough police. And they felt like the police were not taking it seriously. So the Asians started protecting their own. And so in Oakland, they started volunteer groups to actually do street patrols. Uh, in San Francisco, there is a, police station on the edge of San Francisco with bilingual speaking officers. So they have been upping patrolling, especially during Chinese New Year and especially stationed in front of the banks because Chinese deal in cash. And so a lot of these people are very targeted and uh, vulnerable. So um, that's what's happening. People are very aware of it and, and doing something about it. Okay. All right, so uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, it's been great to learn about San Francisco Chinatown, its history and the cultures. Um, so it's been such an enriching experience. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, it was wonderful. Okay, <laughs> okay. so take care, guys. Yay. Happy, New Happy, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy Chinese New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Thank Year. You. I laughed so hard so when Miss Long, you said that Chinese people are looking for discounts. I laughed so hard. <laughs> I, I was like, oh my God, my grandmother would. She's picking Chong off the street. She'll fucking still throw it up in the air to see if it smacks in her hand just to see the weight of it. Because, yeah. like, that's how I actually learned how to pick oranges too, is like if you throw it up in the air, 
and it smacks your hand really, really hard. It's usually full of juice and the, the, the segments of the oranges are really full. That's how I learned how to actually pick Chong too. And then the sheen of the ginger through the plastic because it like, Professor Zhao, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. If you go to the Hong Kong supermarket here in Jersey, where we all know where it is, that's in, in Marlboro, you can see the sheen of the ginger to see how young it is. Sometimes, like if I'm picking it, I'll just smell it because you can usually kind of smell it through the plastic. If it's very fragrant, I'm like, that's the one. I'm picking it. Your grandma taught you well, Sarah. <laughs> oh my God. I used to go, like whenever I used to go to Chinatown with my parent, with my, my dad used to take me to see my grandparents all the time when I was a kid. And I'm literally, I'm going to go see them today and I can't wait because they have my red envelopes for me. So, um, yeah, my, I, you know, I mean, Kathy, I just want to read some strong. comments from the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for having us. What a wonderful lecture. Um, amazing lecture today. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just think it's like so messed up that like, I mean, all three of us, we come from Chinese descent. We're all Chinese. And like, I think it's messed up. Like, we're getting targeted for absolutely no reason. Like, how are we supposed to control a national, like a worldwide pandemic? I think it's ridiculous. Like, even my dad, my dad actually a few months ago when the entire pandemic started, he was called, he was called a chink and a gook and actually in Sam's Club because of the fact that my dad looks more Asian than I do. I'm mixed. So I'm half Hispanic, I'm half Chinese. My dad's fully Chinese. So he was called an Asian, like a gook slash chink in Sam's Club just because he was picking orange juice. I was like, he came home and he told our entire family that. I'm like, this is like ridiculous. Like the Asian community is so prevalent, I think in the tri-state area. And I know it is on the West coast because China is much closer to San Francisco than you know New York and New Jersey is. I think it's ridiculous. Like the Chinese, you would think that China is so prevalent in our economy that there'd be like, thank you for making everything cheaper, but yet we're being targeted, but we're still ordering from Hong Kong and China. Every, like Apple products are not made in the United States, they're made in China. So like, for me, I'm like, okay, we control a very big portion of the economy that goes on in the United States and yet we're getting targeted. So everything that you guys probably have in your house is made in China. I think yeah. it's ridiculous. So if you don't want to support the Chinese, then don't buy Chinese products then. I think okay, for so all of us Asian Americans, just stay the course, you know, stay the course and, and be the, the best person you can be. Yeah. As a human, you know? So I'd like to share another comment, Kathy. 